just like to say uh, thank you to Ashling for coming along to give this kind of occasional talk on behalf of the Sustainable Management of UK Marine Resources Programme. Um, Ashling is the head of evidence for the Marine Management Organisation, which has a huge responsibility for the licensing and regulation of the seas around England and Wales, and hopefully will be major beneficiaries of the SMMR programme. Ashling is, um, has travelled around a wee bit. She did her uh, degree in Scotland at Glasgow University and then moved to Ireland to the Marine Institute and worked between Galway and Cork and is now based in England. So we suspect she'll move to Wales at one point or another. But she's touched all of the, the bases and has you know, quite a wealth of experience. And the Marine Management Organisation is actually quite a complex organisation with a lot of components. And I suspect that not everyone knows how the structure and function of that organisation works. And we're very grateful to welcome Ashling to help explain that to us, um, which will be, as I said, a beneficiary hopefully of the programme. And um, she will be able to explain its uh, interests and uh, activities over the course of the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So thank you. Um, Ashling and welcome to the SMMR programme and let's get going. Thank you very much for that Dave, uh, I really appreciate it. I'm going to um, jump into this as fast as I can so I'm just going to get my screen shared here so I can um, do my presentation for you. So again, thank you very much for taking the time to listen in to this. We at the MMO are really quite excited about the SMMR programme. It really speaks to our requirements which straddle both ecology and sociology, uh, social science. Um, and we, we are delighted that we have the opportunity to partner with um, great people to develop some, some really useful and practical as well as some innovative work around um, ultimately achieving better outcomes for our environment because that is the ultimate aim, um, the ultimate ambition, the ultimate responsibility for the MMO. But as Dave said, it's, um, there are lots of things going on at the MMO and it's going to be helpful, I hope, for me to lay those out a little bit for you today. I'm going to do that in a, in a relatively high level way, but I'm hoping that if you have specific questions, then we can get into the detail. But I, uh, but I want to do that where it suits you and where it, uh, it chimes with your interests, rather than um, uh, to just do a, a blanket detailed expose of the MMO. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is who we are at the MMO and what we do. I'm going to talk about our approach to gathering scientific evidence. One of the important things about the MMO when it was set up, um, and it was set up by the, the, based on the Marine Act, the 2009 Marine Act, was that our decisions are to be evidence-based. So evidence is really quite important at the MMO. So I'll talk about our approach to evidence. I'm going to tell you a bit about our um, new requirements uh, for evidence because we're just moving into a new phase. We, we tend to move in five-year blocks and we've had two five-year blocks in the 10 years that the MMO has been in existence and we're moving into our third five-year block. And so I'll talk a bit about that for you and, um, and go and, and give you a, a good flavor of the kind of new requirements we are going to have. And then uh, finally, I'll just give you a, a quick bit of information about how to be in touch with us. So who we are? Well, the Marine Management Organization is an arm's length body of, um, the, of DEFRA. And we 
operate within England, in the, in the waters in England, out to 200 nautical miles. We also have some responsibilities for some functions um, in some, uh, for some of the devolved administrations. Um, but mainly we're focused on operating within England. And within England, we license, regulate and plan marine activities. And that's to ensure that they're sustainable. And this helps the government to achieve its vision for clean, healthy, productive and biologically diverse oceans and seas. So that's the ultimate aim and ambition. And our, the greatest amount of information about the MMO is available on the gov.uk website on the MMO pages. And that covers all of our roles and responsibilities, who we are, how we operate. And, um, and it also has, crucially, some important pages of information about our evidence requirements. But I'll speak a bit more about those. So what does the MMO do? Well, it licenses marine construction, deposits and dredging. Um, it does this in such a way that it would reduce the environmental, economic and social impact. Um, that's mainly through the use of the environmental impact um, regulations. Uh, we produce marine plans, so we have spent the last 10 years writing marine plans for all of England. They are, we're just about to finish up that um, first big step for marine planning and those, all of the plans will be pu published by next year. The, the main thrust of producing those marine plans is to consult on and agree marine plan policies with stakeholders and the public and to produce a system within which we can secure sustainable industrial activity um, and also achieve our ambitions for environmental management. We are also responsible for making marine nature conservation bylaws for marine protected areas. So that is the main way in which activities are managed within marine protected areas by using management measures which are legally binding um, through bylaws. And we have spent the last few years setting up a, a, a number of bylaws. We are responsible mainly for the bylaws that are outside of 12 nautical miles to the 200 nautical mile limit because the inshore fisheries conservation authorities are responsible for managing the marine protected areas out to 12, out, out to six actually. And then we, uh, we work together on streamlining those bylaws across the entire not to 200 nautical miles. We deal with marine pollution emergencies, including oil spills, but of course that is uh, a, a partnership effort. There's a huge number of people that work on that when that uh, unfortunate um, situation arises. We are the regulator, the enforcer for wildlife legislation and we issue wildlife licenses. We manage and monitor fishing fleet sizes um, and quotas for catches. So this is our fisheries responsibilities. We are the fisheries regulator for England. We ensure compliance with fisheries regulations such as fishing vessel licenses, time at sea and quotas for fish and seafood. And we also manage the funding programmes for fisheries activities. Until recently, that was uh, based on European Maritime Fisheries funding, but now we're moving into a phase of having a marine fund which will operate for England and the UK. We also help to prevent illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing worldwide. We've got an IUU team that are highly involved in um, uh, trying to prevent uh, illegal fishing. And in the last couple of years, we've been leading on the UK Overseas Blue Belt programme for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. So that's a bit about us and what we do. And now I'll tell you a little bit about how we have uh, approached our gathering of evidence to ensure that our decision making um, and we we tend to refer to the activities of our functional teams that's the um, conservation team the fisheries team the licensing team and the planning team we refer to that as decision making so our approach to evidence has been 
to produce a strategy. Initially, when the MMO was set up, it had quite a large budget for uh, securing evidence. But as time has gone on, that budget has reduced quite a bit. And so our last strategy, which was the 2015 to 2020 strategy, was based on working in partnership and collaboration, mainly with academics. And that has been incredibly fruitful. So over the last five years, that is a way of working that has worked really well for us. And so we are really enthusiastic about this new opportunity. And I guess what I would like to say is that we have some experience. So we have a bit of understanding of academic process and requirements and needs. And, um, and we are used to explaining how we operate to academics. And so hopefully we can set up some, some fruitful partnerships based on that. In order to make our um, in order to make our strategy function without a huge amount of money to commission research, we have worked hard to um, put together a list of requirements of evidence requirements based on our functional teams, and we use that list of requirements. We we make it publicly available so anybody can look at it at any time. We keep it updated regularly. It's a dynamic list. And we use that list to indicate to people that that's what we are interested in. So that is a, a helpful resource, we hope, for people. And then we also are very committed to sharing all of the work that we have engaged with and produced. So both the work that we have paid for ourselves, but the work that we um, uh, are also partnering with other people on. So we have a register of all of the evidence that we have used to inform our decision making over the last 10 years. All of that information is available on the MMO web pages on gov.uk. So, um, so it can be found by searching for the evidence strategy for the MMO and under the evidence strategy you will ref you'll find the register which is, um, which is the list of, of, of project reports. And those project reports have unique identifiers which start with, a, with MMO and then a number. Whereas our requirements are also list-based with a, a narrative of, of what those, what, to explain those requirements in, in a bit more detail, those are all given an R number and uh, they are all listed there. So all of that information is available. However, as I've mentioned, we are just moving into a new phase. So it's slightly difficult timing for the SMMR. I would really love to be able to say that we've got everything written down for this new phase that you could just read and um, that I could share with you and, and you could look at at your leisure. But because we're in the process of preparing the new evidence strategy, we don't have everything written down. Now, the evidence strategy itself will look quite similar to what has gone before. It will just be an explanation of our functions, of our evidence requirements, of our partners, of our drivers, and those things I can tell you about. But what I can say is that in the previous evidence strategy, which is still live, what you will find is a section that explains in uh, maybe a, a page worth of text what each of the functions do. And that hasn't changed that much yet. Um, and I say yet, I'll explain why I'm saying yet. But in, in essence, what we do at the MMO is not going to change greatly. So that is a resource for you if you're wondering if the topics that you are thinking about and the ideas you have and the great projects you um, uh, want to submit, if the, that work uh, chimes with what we do at the MMO, then, then definitely do get in touch with us. So this evidence strategy will be accompanied by updated evidence requirements, and these are based on the MMO's new 10-year ambitions. So we're, uh, our CEO likes to say we're 10 years young, um, and in that what he's saying is that we, we still have growing to do, and, but we expect that growing to really happen over the next 10 years. And, and we have matured a bit. So we've been around for 10 years, we've got 10 
we're now looking ahead to the next 10 years and the next evidence strategy and the next evidence requirements will support the ambitions we have for those 10 years. These ambitions are not live yet, they're still in draft, but and so there's no documentation available, but they will be available over the summer. They will become public over the summer. So while you're developing your proposals, these should be available. And certainly in the meantime, we're very happy to talk about them. And uh, what I can tell you is that those ambitions are based on the new fisheries and environment um, bills. They're going through Parliament at the moment. They, we expect them to become acts um, in the not too distant future. So very much based on what's in both of those. We are also really focused on changes that are brought about by EU exit, particularly for fisheries, because that, that could really mean quite a big change for us in terms of our fisheries management. We are very in line, we want to be very in line, we are really uh, responsible for supporting delivery of the 25 year environment plan. So that's a really key document for us. The ambitions of the 25 year environment plan will chime very closely with our 10 year ambitions. We're also quite focused on COP26, which um, as you all probably know was supposed to happen this year, but will now happen next year within the UK. We will be really focused on what we can contribute and what best practice we, um, we can showcase in marine management on, uh, on, on dealing with the climate crisis, uh, the climate emergency. Also, what our ambitions will be based on are the next phase of marine planning. So we, we are just about to reach a really important milestone in 2021, which is to have all marine plans published for, um, uh, for English waters. So we're, we're really moving into and thinking about the next phase of marine plans. And I'll explain a little bit what we're thinking about in terms of that. But that's a big factor for us. It's a big driver for our ambitions. We are also expecting the completion of the network of MPAs around the UK and that and, and, and also um, just yesterday, in fact, based on new recommendations from the Benyon review, we are expecting that there will be highly protected marine areas put in place over the next while as well. So that will be very important for us because we will be the managers for those highly protected marine areas that are within uh, English waters. And of course, the UK marine strategy is a really important driver for us as well. And uh, it's, it's uh, crucial to remember that, uh, or crucial to point out that our, um, our achievement uh, against the indicators for the UK marine strategy is, is, is not as we would want it to be at the moment. So this, that's really quite an important driver. So th that's what will be driving our ambitions for the next 10 years and the new requirements for evidence that we will have. This, um, this indicates that actually there, we, we're, we're probably moving into a new era in which we want to be perhaps using new approaches. And the way I think about this is that we, we're possibly moving out of a kind of a, a, a period of um, very linear approaches and moving into a much more um, an era that embraces much more the complexity of managing natural resources and people and their interactions. So we're really, we're really thinking more about system-based approaches and that's about recovering nature, sustainable use of the environment and the licensing and planning systems. So it's about really integrating marine regulation to achieve the ambitions that we have. It is important for us, and this is what we have learned in partnering with academic institutes before, um, is that we, we have to operate within the current regulatory system. So while we, we greatly appreciate the kind of innovative, new thinking that goes on and, um, and we support it, quite often if we really want to have an impact with research and evidence right now at this point in time we have to be really cognizant of the current regulatory system 
because that's what we have to operate in. Now, at uh, times in the past, that has really presented a challenge and a conflict, but we are at an important point in history in which the regulatory system is probably going to be changed. So we can actually indulge in some of that blue sky thinking at the moment. So it's a little bit about impact for now within the current regulatory system or based on potential statutory instruments which will come from the Environment and the Fisheries Acts when they arrive. So there is some opportunity there to, um, to provide evidence that might influence what those statutory instruments are. And that, that's a really, uh, a really great point at which to be looking to, um, to, to, to this bid and this opportunity to produce some great evidence. So to provide just some very, very uh, headline um, ideas about that integrated marine regulation piece, it's, it's, it's related to securing restoration of the environment and how we can do that within the current regulatory system. In fact, the current regulatory system is very much uh, based on maintaining the state of the current environment, but we, we're, we're totally embracing the idea that we must restore. And, and we would love to work with people that might help us to do that, to figure out how to do that. We also have a, a, an important role to play in achieving net zero via offshore wind, and that's the 40 by 30 um, ambition that the government has. But we, we, if, if it were as easy as just achieving that, then we'd be well on our way. But we have to achieve that with the least environmental impact and the greatest contribution to, um, to, to, to mitigating and adapting to the climate um, situation. So, so again, a very complex situation. And we are really interested in trying to work out how to do that to the best of our capabilities and expertise. We want to achieve better environmental protection and restoration with industry. So it's a more uh, nuanced relationship that we're looking for with industry. And uh, this is part of the 25 year environment plans um, ways of working, which revolve around everyone doing their bit. And in the past, quite, uh, we have often not just the MMO, but ac across the, across the suite of government and non-government organizations, we have firmly stayed within our roles and responsibilities. And I'm not saying we would move out of that, but what we, what we need to do better is, is to work. We need a collective effort. So we need to know how to work better. And I'm, I'm, I just, I've, I've seen some great research out there that is really, really helpful and thought provoking on how to work better across the, the collective. We also want to be able to, we also have to, it's our statutory responsibility to facilitate and support sustainable industry. So that speaks again to that collective effort. Uh, so we're, we're, we're not just the police, if you will. We're not just the regulatory police. We, we are about um, supporting and facilitating good behaviours and good activities that really contribute to achieving uh, ambitions for nature. We have, for a very long time, wanted to tackle the, uh, the cumulative impact and cumulative effects and take that into account in decision making. We've, we've, we've explored many, many different tools and opportunities for that and assessment types, but we are still not quite managing to, 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 to take that into account in our decision making. So somewhere in the system, uh, perhaps not at the tool end, but within that system of decision making, we really need to work together to figure out what is the barrier to us um, uh, taking cumulative effects into account in our decision making. So moving on then to another one of our ambitions, our new ambitions is about supporting coastal communities and working in partnership for better stewardship. And this is really about incentivizing better outcomes for nature and improving knowledge exchange. And that's at multiple scales. That's where the complexity comes in. So we need to integrate and network that delivery across those multiple scales. And at the same time, to improve community resilience, particularly in the face of um, the climate emergency. We also, because of our regulatory responsibilities, we are interested in how to get better compliance and behavior 
but to do that in um, in a in a supportive and facilitating way. We would like to support better stewardship, in particular around coordinating restoration and piloting innovative opportunities um, to to adjust and iterate and adapt our management practices. So there's a, a, a lot of that really speaks to the, um, the social science aspect of this call. And you'll see the connection between these two things. Also in this new era of uh, new management approaches, we have a huge responsibility and a huge opportunity to set up a fisheries manage a national fisheries uh, management system rather than being part of the European system and, 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 and to make this system really and truly ecosystem based and to, um, to develop it along co-management principles. And this is really important to the MMO. We, we, we really want to work with the other marine managers, the IFCAs, our advisors and industry to achieve that. So we're really interested in research projects that are about transforming fisheries management practices within the legislation and regulation we have. So, um, so there's a lot, there's already a lot of uh, amazing expertise, knowledge and research out there about how to, how to do fisheries management in, in a really great way. But what we have to do is to operate within the confines of the legislation and the regulation we have. But I remind you again of what I was saying about the opportunity to influence statutory instruments. We really, in, in, in the true sense of being ecosystem based, we would like to see uh, fisheries management being integrated with environmental management and climate restoration. But again, that's a complex um, operation. and We really, really would be interested in people who are thinking about this type of project. We'd love to hear from you. And, and, and at the really practical end, we just want to know how to go about this in the best possible way, how to go about co-developing and testing co-management um, so that it works for everyone, for the MMO, for the government, for the industry, for, the, uh, for stakeholders who have a vested interest in a better management of our seas. So, I mean, there's a huge amount of detail that, that we could talk about in terms of fisheries, but I don't, I don't have time to go into it here. But this, these are the headlines that we, we're really interested in talking to people about and hearing from people about. Also, because of our responsibility to protect um, through the network of MPAs, we really are interested in protection and that incorporates restoration so that there's better outcomes for biodiversity and climate. So how do we get the most from our network of MPAs? This network was not set up for achieving um, better outcomes for climate or for dealing with the climate emergency. And there's only a certain amount of restoration that goes on within the network of MPAs. So how can we transform ourselves? How can we iterate that um, MPA uh, work management to really provide a, a, a better, better outcomes, again, within the system that we have, with the legislation and regulation that we have. And that's, that's the tricky part of this. We also want to ensure that our designated site management and the marine management are supporting each other and are linked. And there are really important aspects of that, things like displacement, um, the climate again, uh, pelagic, you, you know, we, we are, our MPA system is based on habitats and species, but how are we going to protect the, the really crucial and important pelagic realm, and especially shelf, around the, sh the shelf seas? There's a huge amount of research that goes on in the near shore and in the coastal area, but our responsibility is right out to 200 nautical miles. So shelf seas-based projects we're really, really interested in. So that gives you a, a, an idea of what our new requirements are. And um, it, it's just left for me to say that contacting us is pretty straightforward. You can contact me directly on my email address here, or we have a shared evidence mailbox for the evidence team. And it, please feel free to, to email both or to contact us on both. And um, we're all working uh, at the moment, despite being at home. So we should be able to get back in touch with you pretty quickly. Um, 
so yeah, uh, I, I hope I have provided s some useful information for you. And I'd be really, really uh, interested in any discussion or uh, either here or in, in, in due course about your ideas and your proposals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashling, for that talk. Uh, great to know that there's actually a whole series of documents that are coming out of the MMO and associated with your work that you've highlighted. So uh, lots of reading in the summer for, <laughs> for some people. <laughs> yeah, or just, or just talk to us. And sometimes that's easier. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so for all our attendees who are with us right now, uh, if you have a question that you would like to ask Ashlyn, um, please submit it using the Q&A box that is at the bottom of your screen right now. So I have a question already uh, that has been submitted directly to me. So I'm just going to say it out loud. Um, and it is, do you think the new management system will initially be based on the EU Marine Strategy Framework Directive? That's a really good question. And I, my feeling about that is yes, because the UK Marine Strategy is very much based on that, um, on the MSFD. And the, we still believe, the government still believes and has said this, that good environmental status is the ambition. So, so yes, so that's what we are all working towards. We're still using the 11 descriptors. We're still using the indicators associated with those 11 descriptors. And, and, and overall, in terms of nature and biodiversity, that is, those, are the ambition, those are the goals that, that the government is working towards. And therefore, that is what the MMO will, is working towards as well. Mm -hmm. Understood. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're going to work through those questions that are being submitted through the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So uh, anyone else, please pop them in there. So the first question uh, as well is, can you advise on the best contact at MMO to discuss marine planning project proposals? So what we would like is if you direct all proposals to us in the evidence team, and then we will take the uh, we will speak to the appropriate teams about it. As you can imagine, the marine planning team are really really busy at the moment. They've just come out of a consultation period. They've got a a, a host of marine plans to get uh, written up and published. Mm -hmm. So we have specific um, times when we can talk to them about important evidence proposals. So what we would like is that if you you route the proposal through us and we will ensure that the right people in marine planning are engaged about the proposal. Mm -hmm. At the moment, they don't have a, a, a huge amount of time to be in direct contact, but as time goes on, and especially, especially if your uh, proposal ends up being funded, then we would expect you would be interacting with a, a, a number of people from the marine planning team or any of the other teams. Yes, I should highlight that uh, if anyone has any questions uh, as well, they can always contact the SMMR team directly as well. Uh, our champions are, of course, David Patterson and Mark James. So you can contact either of them with the SMMR email address, which I can pull up on the screen in just a moment. So um, if you kind of want to direct a, a more question that's specifically about SMMR that we might be able to help you with that, please feel free to contact us as well on that email address that I'll show up on the screen in just a moment. So um, just like to highlight that there, but thank you, Ashley, for um, talking about that as well. Um, the next question uh, asks, uh, will the MMO be a part of any of the bids? I hope so. We are, the system is set up so that we can be a partner. And mm -hmm. that's what we would like to be. That's why we're getting involved at an early stage. In the past, quite often, we've provided letters of support at a very late stage in the proposal submitting. But we, we've gotten involved with the SMMR program really early on this time so that we can actually co-develop with you. And that's what we would like. And at the moment, we are um, being supportive of as many of the proposals as we think are relevant to the MMO and over the summer we're happy to discuss with you. Um, yeah, so, so we, we will be happy to be part of bids, yes. Mm -hmm. Understood. Uh, the next question, uh, I think uh, maybe Dave Patterson would like to weigh in on this as well. Uh, to what extent are you interested in coastal intertidal issues and how do you define marine resources? 
So the MMO's responsibilities are from um, uh, from the mean high water springs. And the important thing to note about that is that means that, you know, in some estuaries that really comes quite far into the estuary. We're absolutely interested in intertidal issues and coastal issues. We, our licensing team deals with a huge amount of casework related to the coast and the intertidal. Our marine protected areas are involved in bylaw making with the IFCAs in the coastal and intertidal. And of course, we're regulating the fisheries activities of, um, of, of, of fishing in those areas. So we, yes, is the, is the short answer. We're, we're really interested in coastal and intertidal issues. Um, and in terms of defining marine resources, uh, I'm not sure what the context is about where the marine resources uh, comes from exactly, whether that was in my presentation or not, but essentially any part it doesn't need to be biological. Uh, it can be um, geological and all of the interactions. I count the interactions and the processes, the important processes that go on. That's all part of the resource. I think I see the, the whole thing as being the marine resource. Uh, but the, 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 I guess the more uh, natural part of it. Understood. If that doesn't answer your question, then do uh, clarify yeah, with me. And absolutely. Um, to the person who submitted that, they can just resubmit a more expanded question if they want. Obviously, you can contact us, as I said, on the SMMR email address uh, if there's any questions about the actual programme. And obviously, all the resources about the SMMR programme are online on our website as well. Um, the next question is from Tom as a second part to a previous question. And they ask, are there any marine conservation orders beyond the 12 for fish? fisheries so um, you might need a bit more explanation behind that question I'm not sure um, if you need anything else on that Ashling. Yeah it might be helpful if Tom was able to speak to this so I'm presuming that um, so in terms of it's just the term conservation order so I'm not sure mm -hmm. if the if what you're referring to Tom is the um, uh, the bylaws in terms of bylaws for marine protected areas, um, there are for sure. Um, but in terms of specific fisheries, that is, uh, um, I can't they, answer that they, question. They've just, they've just confirmed, yes, bylaws yeah, beyond the bylaws, 12. Yes, 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 yes. There are definitely bylaws beyond the 12. Um, I think we probably have to look into the detail in terms of fisheries. One of the things that I'm really interested in is that the, uh, the fisheries bill talks about this opportunity for uh, extended powers, extended bylaw making powers beyond marine protected areas for the MMO. And I think there's, there's, it, that could be a really fruitful avenue to explore in terms of what could be achieved for um, combining fisheries and marine management in that area. So that would be, I think, really worth exploring. Sounds good, yeah. Um, our next question is kind of more about that dynamic uh, of collaborating, how to work better that you were talking about, um, saying, uh, could you please elaborate on how you're already working with academics and what you think would be a really effective form uh, of working with academics um, in this bid or um, just in general as well, I guess, as well. So one of the things that strikes me about the SMMR program is that it's, it's, it's pretty practical. It's looking for impact and outcome in a relatively short amount of time. I mean, you and I know that some academic work really, it, it, it's, it's a long-term endeavor, but, but this program is looking for impact in a, in a relatively short period of time. So my expectation is that in this case, we would like to work as practically on, on really practical questions and practical issues, um, we would like to be able to provide all the knowledge and expertise we have that will help you to understand how the MMO makes decisions, what legislation we work under, what are our challenges, 
and then to open ourselves up to discuss with you what our ambitions are and what, how we think we might want to achieve those things. And then for there to be uh, an innovative and creative space where we could talk about um, new ways of doing things, but also applying existing knowledge to some of our issues. Um, that, is, that is how we have been working in the past and that has been really effective for us. So we have some academics that work on very specific requirements that we have that might be time bound and relatively small questions. They might have to do with mapping something or um, finding a straightforward answer. And then we have other requirements which are about how do you apply the natural capital approach? I mean, that's huge. What can the MMO do about climate? That's huge. These are really big questions. So on those questions, we need to work together to break it down a little bit into those areas we think we can have some impact on. Um, and they're much bigger, more ongoing things. But what I would hope, I mean, the MMO has developed relationships that have, that have become ongoing uh, in the last mm. five years with academics. And what I would hope is that the SMMR will, will, will bear new fruits, that we will be able to develop relationships with new academics and that we'll be able to start working together in the longer term as well. Yeah, all about that constant communication and objectives working together. That's uh, what you were speaking about earlier. Um, and so uh, the next question uh, comes in. Uh, actually, no, we've reached the uh, end of our questions for you, Ashling, I believe. Um, so at the minute, if anyone has any other questions that they would like to ask in the session, please can they submit them into uh, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen for Ashling. If you have any direct questions about the SMMR itself, uh, please check out the SMMR website itself and you can email David and Mark James, um, the SMMR champions for any of those nitty gritty questions about the process as well. Um, so Ashling, I can't see any other questions that are coming in right now. So, um... well, the only other thing to say mm -hmm. is that if 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 this information hasn't been that useful for you, and it's it's not covered the the things that actually would get to the nitty gritty of the the proposals you're thinking about submitting then please do let me know and we can try and have a conversation about what is of most importance to you. Um, I'm really happy to do that. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, and as it shows on the screen, those are the contact details uh, for Ashling and the MMO. And I'm just going to pull up on the screen our website address and obviously our emails as well. So uh, I'm just going to hand over to uh, David Patterson to close the session. And I would just like to remind uh, you, the viewers, that this session has been recorded. It will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and will also be available on the SMMR website itself. So thank you, Ashling, for today's webinar. Thank you for listening. I would just like to say um, huge thanks to Ashling for that. We're entering a really complex period where this would have been bad enough without having all of the changes that are going to come in because of Brexit. And entering this new phase of the Marine Management Organisation is, is a challenge and an opportunity because I'm sure some of us think that we can maybe do things better than they've been done in the past and using a systems-based approach and trying to understand the complexity of the system is something that I guess we would all strive for. But thank you for putting that so clearly for us and for the offer for future contact. That's extremely valuable. So thank you very much. And remember that this session has been recorded and will be available on the MAST's YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you.